Yo, what is going on, everyone? My name is Nick, or The Notorious Fantasy, and in today's video, we're going to be breaking down my must-add players for week number three of the 2023 fantasy football season off of the waiver wire. We're going to be talking about five running backs, five wide receivers, three quarterbacks, and three tight ends that you guys want to not just walk, run to the waiver wire right now and pick up. Some of you guys might be 0-2, you might be praying to the football gods above that Monday Night Football goes your way. Some of you might be... 2-0, 1-1, doesn't matter because today we are going to look to get another W in week number three and for the rest of the season so you can ultimately win your fantasy football championship. If you do end up enjoying today's video, make sure you hit that subscribe button down below if you're new, whether you are new to the channel or not, make sure you leave a like. It helps me out a ton. If you want to follow me on Twitter, please do so at NotoriousFNTSY. And if you want my weekly rankings, they're on Patreon for $7.50 and I answer every single question on the Patreon. So make sure you guys check that out. But without further ado, let's get into my week number three waiver wire ads. We begin with the must-add running backs of the week. Kyron Williams of the LA Rams going up against the Cincinnati Bengals in Cincinnati for a rematch of the Super Bowl from two years ago. Now, unlike in the Super Bowl, we may not end up seeing Joe Burrow or Joe Heisty play in this game. People have been calling him Joe Heisty because he robbed the Cincinnati Bengals for that fat contract just for the team to be 0-2. Right now, Kyron Williams is 60.7% owned on ESPN and 34.1% owned on NFL Fantasy. We are are going to breeze through Kyron Williams, though, because he is owned in a ton of leagues. Shockingly, though, he's available in 34.1% of leagues on NFL Fantasy, which just goes to tell you from website to website, the ownership percentage could be, in a lot of scenarios, greatly different. Kyron was the RB2 in PPR last week prior to the doubleheader on Monday Night Football, which was shocking, right? Because I think most level-headed people, me included, were incredibly nervous about this matchup for the Rams up against the 49ers. Puka Nakua's held was up in the air. Kyron Williams sure was coming off of a heater in week number one, but how is he going to fare up against the 49ers defense? In reality, the LA Rams offense stood tall in that game and played incredibly well. 14 carries for Mr. Kyron Williams for 52 yards and a score. Six receptions on 10 targets for 48 yards and another touchdown. So two total tugs in that game. Deshaun Watson would love two tugs in one day. Cam Akers was a healthy scratch in that game. And it appears that we are in the same exact shit we were in last year. Deja vu. Cam Akers is potentially going to get traded off of the LA Rams. So this would lead to Kyron Williams being a goat pickup last week, right? If you picked up Kyron Williams, you're probably laughing straight to the bank. And if he's still available, you definitely want to pick him up right now prior to week number three. At number two, we have Zach Moss running back of the Indianapolis Colts at the Baltimore Ravens. This week, right now, we do not know the health of Anthony Richardson, if he'll be able to go or not in this matchup up against the Ravens in Baltimore. Anthony Richardson looked incredible in that game in week number two, looked good in week number one it's just a shame that he got injured during the start of the game he didn't even make it like halfway through the game 32.1 percent owned for zach moss on espn 50 and a half percent owned on nfl running back nine on the week in ppr week two up against the houston texans in houston 18 carries for 88 yards and a touchdown four receptions on four targets for 19 yards while my love for zach williams will definitely change if Anthony Richardson is not good to go in this game in week number three, ultimately that does not change my mind on picking up Zach Moss because who knows when Jonathan Taylor is going to come back, right? Who knows? Deion Jackson looked like a steaming pile of dog shit as the lead back for the Colts. So Zach Moss looked good against the Texans. I know the Texans aren't some stout defense. This isn't the 85 Bears, but I don't think the Ravens off or Ravens defense really is super scary either. Now they're fine to pick up the stream, especially if Gardner Minshew is under center. But I think Zach Moss could have yet another good game. Again, 18 carries for 88 yards and a score and four receptions on four targets, four for four, like he was at Wendy's for 19 yards. I think Zach Moss is the clear lead back there until Jonathan Taylor either shows up or doesn't show up there's a chance that Zach Moss is the lead back for the rest of the season at number three we got Gus Bus Edwards of the Baltimore Ravens going up against the Indianapolis Colts in Baltimore 32% owned on ESPN 32.4% owned on NFL running back 19 on the week in PPR week two up against the Bengals in Cincinnati in a game where 
the Ravens really controlled the whole game. I thought this was going to be a close one. I thought the Bengals were going to bounce back. But nope, the Bengals take the L. 10 carries for 62 yards and a score for Gus Edwards. Now, Gus Edwards did end up getting outsnapped by Justice Hill in this game, 57% to 43%. But Gus Edwards looks like the better back. Gus Edwards is the veteran back on this team. The problem with Gus Edwards is, and what doesn't make me just run to the fucking waiver wire like Hussein Bolt or The Flash to pick this guy up, is because Justice Hill is there. They have Melvin Gordon. There's a chance they still bring in another running back, and that's why we talked about it last week in the running back waiver wire ad section of the waiver wire video, that, hey, I don't want you guys to blow your fab, to blow your waiver priority on a guy like Gus Edwards or Justice Hill because there's a chance this is a straight-up three-headed monster committee, or there's a chance that two weeks from now, once Jonathan Taylor comes off the IR, the pup, that he ends up getting traded and he's the lead back on the Ravens, right? Or the Ravens end up bringing in some other running back like Leonard Fournette or something, right? So again, Gus Edwards is my number three running back pickup. Sure, if you need someone to play, right? You're in dire need. You lost Saquon Barkley for the next potential three weeks, which is the report that we're about to talk about with Matt Burita. Sure, get Gus Edwards. But again, am I going to be overwhelmingly confident banging my chest for Gus Edwards up against the Colts defense? No. Is he a shit tier start? No. But he's also just not a guy that I'm going to claim like I have 100% confidence in is going to just score the touchdown because you're going to need a touchdown for Gus Edwards to be successful at number four, Matt Burita of the Giants going up against the San Francisco 49ers who also are the Giants in baseball. Very interesting stat that no one gives a shit about. 1.1% owned on ESPN, 0.2% owned on NFL Fantasy. So Saquon Barkley is expected to miss three weeks weeks as he suffered a quote-unquote ordinary ankle sprain in week two up against the Arizona Cardinals. Watching that game, it looked like Saquon Barkley got his fucking leg blown off by a IUD. Is that the thing that the girls have inside of them? IED, one of those things in the fucking forest of Vietnam, right? That's what it sounded like. What it looked like. His face, he was like, Arr! now again, if I fucking suffered an ankle sprain, I'd be crying like a bitch. So I get it. But the way that Saquon reacted, in my head, I'm like, holy shit, the season's over, right? I think that's what most people thought watching that game, right? That his leg fucking exploded like the guy in Tropic Thunder. Remember that? So, again... I'm glad Barkley isn't out for the season. Obviously, I wasn't rooting for an injury there. The Giants looked good in the second half. The first six quarters of football for the Giants was hard to watch, but they did bounce back. I don't know what the fuck Brian Dable told them in the locker room to get them all fired up, but the Rams did just run a train on the Niners' defense, but I don't really expect Matt Burita to do that. He does appear to be the lead back, though. They got Matt Burita, Eric Gray, and Gary Brightwell. So, you lost Saquon, put a bid in for Matt Burita, pick up Matt Burita, but again, you just gotta hope you have some other running back on your roster that can really fill in the spot, especially against the 49ers, because again, I know the Rams played close, but that might just be because that's a division rivalry matchup, right? This might be a SmackDown brother like the Hulkamaniacs on Thursday Night Football from the 49ers against the Giants. At number five, Roshan Johnson of the Chicago, Chicago Bears at the Kansas City Chiefs. 30.5% owned on ESPN, 13.6% owned on NFL. Running back 32 on the week, week two up against the Bucks in Tampa Bay. Four carries for 32 yards, two receptions on two targets for 10 yards. Uh, Roshan looked really good in week one. It still appears that Khalil Herbert's the guy, but... There's a chance that this offense does shift to Roshan being the lead back. Obviously, right now, Roshan is just kind of a stash play. Throw him on your bench. Stash him a couple weeks from now. Maybe the Chicago Bears start percolating. Maybe the Chicago Bears offense turns the tide, rights the ship, and they end up looking good because right now, that Bears offense is really bad. Moving now to the wide receivers. If you have enjoyed this far, hit that subscribe button down below if you're new. Whether you are new or not, hit that like button. Helps me out a ton. The wide receivers. We begin with my guy, Nico Cousin. Let's go bowling. Nico Collins of the Houston Texans going up against the Jacksonville Jaguars at 
Jacksonville, 62% owned on ESPN, 44.1% owned on NFL. Wide receiver, 5 on the week. Back-to-back, Jordan, 96-97 weeks with over 9 targets. 7 receptions on 9 targets for 146 yards and a touchdown. Now, I know C.J. Stroud isn't putting up fucking amazing stats week in and week out. And I know that the offensive line of the Houston Texans is a sieve. It's like when Moses parts the Red Sea. They just open wide for the defense to just get all up in C.J. Stroud's face. But C.J. Stroud's looked pretty good to me. Looks like, wow, if the Texans can figure things out, C.J. Stroud might end up being a great quarterback in the National Football League. Nico Collins appears to be the clear, undisputed wide receiver number one in this offense. This game against the Jaguars might get a little spicy. I think we can see Nico Collins find pay dirt again in the end zone. Should be able to get nine targets again, back-to-back weeks with over nine targets. I like Nico Collins a ton. Again, I was banging the drum all offseason for him. And we're going to continue to hope that Nico Collins keeps dominating 50 Shades of Grey style. At number two, we got 2-2 at well of the LA Rams going up against the Cincinnati Bengals in Cincinnati. 31.7% owned on ESPN, 19.9% owned on NFL. Wide receiver 28 on the week in PPR. Again, all of these stats for the finish on the week are prior to Monday Night Football, the doubleheader. Because guess what? Monday Night Football has not happened yet. And shockingly, next week we got a doubleheader on Monday Night Football as well. Let me know in the comment section. If you have questions about the waiver wire, obviously, let me know what you think about the double header games on Monday Night Football because it's not really a double header because one game starts at 7 15, I think the other one starts at 8 15. So they're going on at the same time. If you only have one TV, you're fucking flipping through the channel. It's probably annoying. I have to say, I don't really like it, but some people love it. So let me know what you guys think. So, wide receiver 28 on the week, not the best, but again, up against the 49ers, I was expecting a beatdown of the 49ers when in re- or from the 49ers. In reality, it was a close game. Really, it was a 10-point game, but they kicked a field goal to destroy every single person who bet on the 49ers minus seven and a half or seven. I don't remember which one it was, but uh, seven receptions on nine targets for 77 yards for 2-2 Atwell. One rush for five yards. The Rams' offense appears to be the real deal, right? I was someone that was very cautious with Matthew Stafford entering into the NFL season because I know all the reports were very positive out of training camp, but sometimes the training camp reports are a little bit fugazi, right? You got these beat reporters just slobbing on the guy's knobs like corn on the cob because they write for the team. They give him a little suka la mink. They give him the gawk gawk 9000, but... Matthew Stafford just looked good. It doesn't appear that his neck, his back, his pussy, or his crack are impacting his play. And I I get Puka's the wide receiver one now until Cup comes back because obviously when Cup comes back, he'll be the number one receiver. It's not like Puka is that good, but Puka looks good. So at least until Cup comes back, which again, the football gods were praying for week five if you drafted Cooper Cup. But let's be honest, Sean McVay hasn't really been super positive about Cup being back in week five, right? It is still very much up in the air. So at least for two more weeks, you got Atwell as the number two receiver. So week three and week four, at least as the number two guy in an offense, that is a little bit spicy. And against the Bengals, this one might be a higher scoring game. Again, assuming that Joe Scheisty ends up playing. So pretty safe floor weekly and definitely some high upside out of 2-2 Atwell even though he's just a little short king at number three we got Jaden Reed of the Green Bay Packers going up against the New Orleans Saints at home in Lambeau Field 13.9% owned on ESPN 6.1% owned on NFL wide receiver 18 on the week in PPR week two up against the Atlanta Falcons hot Atlanta Four receptions on eight targets for 37 yards and two scores. Now, Christian Watson's availability is very unknown, right? I was someone that was like, all right, he missed week one. He'll he'll be back for week two, right? And then week two comes and it's like, oh, he's out. What do we know right now? Again, I'm as much of a doctor as Johnny Sins, so I'm not here to fucking analyze Christian Watson's injury or something, but it seemed like everything I was reading was like, he's going to be good to go for week two. So I would assume he comes back for week three. But again, it's still up in the air. It seems like either Reed or Dobbs will pop off every game without Watson. 
I was someone that was banging the drum heavily in the offseason for Jaden Reed, talking about how I think Jaden Reed is going to overtake Romeo Dobbs as the number two receiver behind Christian Watson. And maybe that is the case. We talked about the quarterback situation looking pretty good in Houston with C.J. Stroud. Looks like Jordan Love was a great pick, despite the fact that he had to ride the pine for what felt like a century with Rodgers. Now he's the guy he's thrown three or more touchdowns, three touchdowns, I believe, in each of the first two games. Spoiler alert, we're going to talk about Jordan Love in the quarterback section of today's video. Jordan Love looks good. He looks the part. And Jaden Reed looked good, looked like a red zone threat for Jordan Love. Again, am I going to clamor for you that you have to start him in week three? No, but there's some tough wide receiver cores out there. There's injuries, and Jaden Reed looks pretty good, especially if Christian Watson ends up missing. Knock on wood, though, because I want Christian Watson to come back because he's on, like, all my fantasy teams. At number four, we got Josh Reynolds. We talked about him last week in the Wave of Wire video of the Lions. Got up against the Atlanta Falcons at home in Detroit. 4.7% owned on ESPN, 1.8% owned on NFL. Wide receiver nine on the week in PPR. Josh Reynolds went fucking ballistic, bro. Went nuclear like his name was Oppenheimer. Week two versus Seattle. Five receptions on six targets for 60 six yards and not one but two tugs in that game two weeks in a row with at least six targets the Atlanta Falcons defense actually deserves a little bit more credit than people give them a lot of people just like to shit on the Atlanta Falcons the Atlanta Falcons are actually a pretty good team if I'm being honest with you I know it sucks for fantasy when they don't throw the ball to Kyle Pitts who is just butt naked wide open or Drake London who miraculously by the grace of the football god scored a touchdown last week I know that, hey, it sucks for fantasy, but if you watch those games from, you you take all the fantasy out of your mind, right? And you're like, okay, I'm just going to watch the Falcons as the Falcons are an NFL team. Arthur Smith is a top five coach right now in betting odds as coach of the year. Do I think Arthur Smith's going to win coach of the year? Fuck no, baby. But the way he's got those boys running and the way that defense looked, the defense... I know, Nick, it's preseason. I watched that Dolphins preseason action against Atlanta, and the Atlanta defense looked good. The Atlanta defense has brought in some new pieces. They look pretty good. Again, I'm not here to give them the gawk gawk 9,000, say the Falcons have one of the better defense in the NFL, but the defense is a little bit underrated, though the Lions just came off of a shootout loss up against Seattle. I think this could have a high-scoring game potential. And again, Josh Reynolds is going to get six-plus targets. If he finds pay dirt, finds the end zone, he would have been a fine start on the week. At number five, this is where you could basically list off a bunch of players. Like, Deontay Johnson is going to miss the next four weeks. At least he's been put on the IR, sadly. So you can add Allen Robinson as the number two piece in Pittsburgh as, like, the number five waiver ad. I'm going to go with Isaiah Hodgins because I just like him better, right? It's more... Isaiah Hodgins is way more of a sexy play than fucking Allen Robinson. New York Giants receiver going up against the 49ers in San Francisco. 4.7% owned on ESPN, 1.5% owned on NFL. Like we talked about with Matt Burita, right? This offense was just moving the ball at snail's pace in the first two games. Right up against the Cowboys, they got bent over a table, and it was bad. Then they come out. First half of week two. Same shit, different day. Right? The ball hits Saquon. It flies up in the air. It's a pick. I think that might have even been a pick six, right? Josh Dobbs came out there, looked like fucking Lamar Jackson or J Jalen Hurts or something, right? It was just a disaster. And then the second half, they make the big comeback. But at what cost? Just like Thanos said everything because Barkley's out for the next three weeks, most likely. But Daniel Jones looked much refreshed in the second half like he had a drank a gallon of water or something at halftime and it looked good daniel jones one of the best quarterbacks on the week in fantasy i know the giants defense shit the bed there's been some comments nick you idiot you buffoon you told me to start uh the the giants defense against the cardinals and they got absolutely fucked yeah i know i did the same thing right i give you the advice and i do the same thing right not lying to you guys right these are my real opinions 49ers defense is tough. Again, I get the Rams played stout there, but I think Isaiah Hodgins is a good snag. I think he will end up being the best receiver on the Giants in fantasy. 
outside of maybe Darren Waller, he will be like the number one target weekly. And with Saquon Barkley out, we should see more targets for Mr. Hodgins. Before we pivot, though, into the quarterbacks and the tight ends, I would like to give you guys a quick word for our friends and our sponsor over at Underdog Fantasy. Underdog Fantasy is the best place to play NFL Pick'em in the whole entire universe. And the game is incredibly simple. There are two games on Monday Night Football, so there's even more choices to choose from here. For instance, tonight, I really do like 9-inch Nicholas Chubb higher than 81.5 rushing yards. And I think Jamal Williams bounces back with higher than 58.5 rushing yards. You need to have at least two picks for this to end up working. If you put in three picks, you get six times your entry fee. Four picks, ten times. Five picks, you can get 20 times your entry fee, and the normal two picks here will get you three times your entry fee. If you are new to Underdog Fantasy and this sounds interesting to you, make sure you sign up using the link in the video description. For a first match deposit bonus of up to $100, if you deposit $100, they give an additional $150, additional $50, $25, additional $25. The minimum deposit on Underdog Fantasy is $10. You have to be located in one of these states listed on your screen if you want to play in these pick um contests. And if you have a gambling problem, please make sure that you call 1-800-GAMBLER. Back on into things, we move to the quarterback position, moving to Jordan, love me tender, love me sweet, of the Green Bay Packers going up against the Saints at home in Lambeau Field. The Cheeseheads ultimately fall to 1-1 one and one after losing and kind of choking away a, if you're listening on audio, sounds like something else was happening, but you get what I mean, right? A down game for... Not a down game because the Packers look good, but bad. It's a bad play in the fourth quarter, right? Didn't move the ball very effectively, but how much can we shit on Jordan Love? Because I don't think anyone really had that much expectations of him this season, right? I was a big Jordan Love guy, but it seemed like everyone in the comments thought this guy was a fucking bench warmer. 39.8% owned on ESPN, 41.6% owned on NFL. Quarterback 16 on the week in week two up against the Atlanta Falcons in Atlanta. 14 completions on 25 attempts for 151 yards and three touchdowns. Two rushes for 23 yards. I know 150 yards, not mouthwatering, but this is back-to-back games with three touchdowns. He did it in week one. People are like, oh, Aaron Jones carried him, this, that, and the other thing. But he did that without Christian Watson. Week two, there's no Aaron Jones or no Christian Watson, and he throws up three tugs yet again. So is he gonna get, is he guaranteed to throw three touchdowns against the Saints? Don't think so, because the Saints defense is relatively good. But could he throw two touchdowns, 200 yards? Yeah, and have a decent game. I, I definitely think so. There are some real tough matchups at the quarterback position this week. So Jordan Love might actually be a spicy waiver wire ad for you guys. And if you're someone that, oh, maybe Joe Burrow doesn't play, then I think Jordan Love would be a great pickup for you. Next up, we got Sam Howell, leader of the Howell Band of the Washington Commanders, going up against the Buffalo Bills at home in Washington. 9.4% owned on ESPN, 5.3% owned on NFL Fantasy. Quarterback 13 on the week up against the Broncos country. Let's ride. Week two at Denver. That might have been one of the most hilarious endings I've ever seen to an NFL game. Russell Wilson uncorks a fucking piss missile eight gazillion yards down the field for a touchdown on the Hail Mary. And the way it was caught, it wasn't like one of those Aaron Rodgers (laughs) fucking Hail Marys where somehow the other guy named Rodgers is just open and bam, he catches it. This is one of those where they're playing fucking volleyball with the ball, play keep it up, and somehow someone catches it on the Denver Broncos. And then they get for the two-point conversion, right? They just converted the impossible, right? They just did the upset of the US, US of A versus Russia in hockey, the miracle on ice. They basically pulled every trick out of their ass, a rabbit out the hat, and then you lose the game, not because you can't convert this crazy Hail Mary, but because you can't get a two-point conversion from three inches out. Uh, Sam Howell looked good in that game, though, up against what I would describe as a good Broncos defense. I don't think there's any reason to believe that the Broncos defense is just washed. Maybe not a top 12 unit in the NFL, but definitely at least middle of the road. In mile high, the Wolf man, Sam Howell, went 27 on 39 attempts, 27 completions, 39 attempts for 299 yards, one shy of 300, like the movie, and two touchdowns, two rushes for 30, or two touchdowns and then two rushes for 13 yards. Seems like Eric Bieniemy has done well, man in the ship as the offensive coordinator of the Commanders. 
And you want to know something funny? The Commanders are averaging a boatload of points on offense with Bietemi. Bietemi leaves the Chiefs, and the Chiefs' offense isn't as good. Now, does that mean that, that uh, fucking that fat bastard, um, Andy Reid, I almost forgot his name, Andy Reid is not a great coach? No, but, like, Eric Bietemi clearly had some type of impact on the team. Two straight games with over 30 passing yards. And I know this isn't the best matchup up against Let's Go Buffalo, but could end up being a high-scoring affair, right? We know Joshua turn of the ball over. Josh Allen is good for, for some fucking reason, even though I don't think the commander's defense is really all that great. Just throwing two picks for no reason, and then, like, magically this is a dog fight, or magically later on in the game this ends up being way closer than you would think. And then... You know, th this might be a look-ahead game for the Bills, right? They play the Dolphins in, I believe, Buffalo in Week 4. Might be a look-ahead game for the Dolphins against the Broncos, which kind of scares me as a Dolphins fan. But maybe maybe the Bills get a little loose here. They do some messed up things, and Sam Howell has to put his cape on Superman-style, Cam Newton-style, and save the day. So again, am I banging the drum like I'm playing fucking Guitar Hero for Sam Howell this week? No, but... Again, there's a lot worse options than him. I try to give you the best of what's on the waiver wire. At number three, we got my main man, the headband, Baker Mayfield of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers going up against the Fly Eagles Fly at home in Tampa Bay. 10.4% owned on ESPN, 4.2 or 5.2% owned on NFL. The Bucs are firing the cannons. The Bucs are two and oh. Who would have thought that? Who would have thought entering into the season that Baker Mayfield would play good enough for the Bucs to be 2-0, especially against the Vikings in Week 1? I know. the Nick, the Bears suck. Okay. Okay, but I don't think anyone thought they were going to beat the Vikings. Week 2 versus Chicago. He was the quarterback 18 on the week. 26 completions on 34 attempts for 300-plus yards, 317 yards, and a tug. Six rushes for 17 yards. Don't love the matchup. But the Eagles' defense might be on fraud watch because the Eagles' defense is a little banged up, a little suspect, didn't play great in Week 1 didn't, against the Deflatriots, didn't look good in Week 2 against the Vikings. Kirk Cousins was surgical out there, had on his fucking gloves like he was O.J. Simpson. But if the glove didn't fit, we must have quit. And the Eagles ended up winning both of those games. But again, maybe a little bit fraudulent of the Eagles. So, again, Baker Mayfield is about as risky as as it gets, right? It's like throwing it in there raw and giving it a good old cream pie. But ultimately, Baker Mayfield seems like he's got that dog in him. Seems like he's got that fire. Again, it might flame out. This might be the game where Baker ends up having a disaster class, three picks. But Baker's look good so far. Again, I'm just talking more about his history as like a guy that's like, oh, Baker's got the chip on his shoulder. Bro's got a fucking Pringle on there and he has these huge games. And then, oh, now we suck. Oh, we suck again. Like that, uh, what movie is that from? With Bobby Boucher, I think. Oh, no, we suck again. You don't talk about Adam Sandler? But yeah, let's see what Baker does. Moving now to the final position here. Tight ends before we close things out. Everyone loves a nice tight end. Shout out to... Violet Myers, Hunter Henry, New England Patriots, tight end at the New York Jumbo Jets, 34.6% owned on ESPN, 55.7% owned on NFL. The battle of mid, the Patriots versus the Jets, the bottom feeders in the AFC East. All of these Patriots fans, now I'm a Dolphins fan, so I'm just going to go off on a tangent for four seconds. You can fucking hit the button a couple times to skip, but I think you're going to want to hear this. The, oh, the, the Patriots, Nick. Oh, don't sleep on Bill Belichick, Nick. Oh, Mac Jones looked good against the, 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 the Eagles in week one. Nick, aren't you scared of the Patriots? No. I said no, I wasn't scared. Thought it would be close. But ultimately, I thought my boy Tua Us Uno was going to come out on top. And that motherfucker has Bill Belichick's head on a spike. Like in, uh, what is that called? Oh, Lord of the Flies. Lord of the Flies. We pulled that one from deep in our brain from high school. Anyone who's read that, you know what I'm talking about. Spike on the sword. Game of Thrones. 5-0, Tua. Up against, up against old Bill Belichick. Fraudulent coach without Tom Brady. But I'm not here to shit on the Patriots. I'm here to talk good against about the Patriots here. Because again, while Mac Jones isn't very good, Hunter Henry has looked incredible. 
Mike Gesicki's role in this offense is not very good. I mean, he seems like he has a pretty, Hunter Henry has a pretty strong stranglehold over the tight end one role in this offense. I mean, unless you want to not get a first round, uh, first down and then pitch the ball back to your old lineman and then be short and then have all your fans bitching on the internet. What's funny, though, is the fact that the guy's last name is Strange and he's number 69 on the Patriots, that's funny, right? Like, if I wasn't a Patriots hater, I would rock a Strange 69 jersey because that's just funny. Back-to-back games with five or more receptions, 50-plus yards, and a tug for Hunter Henry. I did number two on the week in PPR up against the Dolphins in Foxborough. Six receptions on seven targets for 52 yards and a touchdown. Uh, Final thing for the Patriots fans, how about them apples, baby? Fins up. Uh, we're going for 3-0 this week against the Broncos, and just love. Now, again, Nick, you're supposed to be talking about fantasy football, not the Dolphins. It's my video. My video. I can do whatever I want, right? And I think a lot of the time, most people come here, obviously for the information, but to have a laugh, right? And I think what I have to say about the Dolphins is true, and I think some people find it funny. So, again, the Patriots. Oh, my God, we have all these rings. Guess what? That's in the past, pal. It's over for the Patriots. For the Miami Dolphins, and... Oh man, dude, if the Dolphins ever win a Super Bowl, which I don't I honestly don't think they ever will because they might just be cursed or something, you guys will never hear the end of it. At number two, Zach Ertz, the famous fantasy name of my ball, Zach Ertz of the Arizona Cardinals, going up against the Cowboys at home in Arizona. Shockingly, he's owned in 47% of leagues on ESPN, 20% on NFL. Tight end seven on the week. This guy just all all he does is get receptions and targets eight plus targets in back-to-back games and six receptions week two up against the g-men six receptions on eight targets for 56 yards again are the cardinals going to be great against the dallas cowboys offense or against the cowboys defense fuck no baby but could zach Ertz crawl on the ground to eight plus targets again six receptions and have a decent day in ppr half ppr yeah number three we got the other tight end that game jake ferguson of the cowboys got up against the cardinals in arizona 12.4 percent owned on espn 4.6 percent owned on nfl tight end 11 on the week and whoever the was it tony romo i don't remember who was the announcer of that game they were on they literally had to zip jake ferguson's pants up after that one after he scored that touchdown oh i was telling mike mccarthy all week that Jake Ferguson was going to get a touchdown. I even told my son to play him in fantasy football this week. What the fuck? Dude, I can't stand Romo and is it Collinsworth with him? Can't stand it, dude. They are like jerking each other off, a fucking rub and tug in there together. It's so brutal. And I, I might just be, Nick, you're a fucking hater. <laughs> okay. Uh, maybe I am. But tight end 11 on the week. Week two versus the Jets. Three receptions on four targets for 11 yards and a touchdown. Less targets than in week one. In week one up against the sorry Giants. He had 11 targets. But it's clear he's going to be involved in that red zone package. And uh, let's see how Ferguson performs against a good team, right? In a more back and forth game, not just a beat down all game long but i don't think we're going to see that this week up against the cardinals and joshua dobbs so thank you guys all so much for watching if you did end up enjoying make sure you hit that subscribe button down below hit that like button down below as well smash that fucking like button like it owes you some money i love you guys all so much from deep down in the bottom of my heart i'm so pumped for the double header of monday night football tonight even though it's going to be annoying switching from channel to channel but i got two tvs uh so i'm good i just got one on each tv i genuinely love you guys so much uh, for all the support we've seen recently it means the world to me i want to hopefully get to 30,000 subscribers soon and again none of this is possible without you guys so thank you guys for everything i'm very appreciative of every single one of you guys even those who aren't subscribed you should hit that subscribe button but even those who aren't subscribed that watch the videos leave comments like the video it means the world to me so thank you guys for everything i love you guys all so much hope you all have a great one and uh let's eat some w's in week three baby i know some some of you guys might be owing too Don't panic yet, baby. Week three, comeback season. Love you guys, as always. Good boy!